Okay, guys, you're on a date with a brand new possible love interest. I thought I was recording a podcast. Uh, <laughs> God damn it. Yeah. What is the one trait you find the most fascinating in people? And what is the one trait that would get you to get up and walk away mm. right away? Let's grab the oh. dice and roll it. Damn, these are good questions. You I got a two. Out of four? I got a cock to dice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Bye. you do, Terry. Oh, no, yeah, but uh, you knocked down. You knocked me to 12, so, so I'll go first. first. Um, for me, uh, if if it's a uncontrollable trait, which is kind of the thing that I I, I uh, was leading towards with this question, it's the laugh. Mm. If 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 they've got a very unique, charming laugh, I'm not talking like a Fran Drescher. I don't want that. <laughs> I don't want that. Oh, God. But I I uh, like my wife, who I love and adore. One of the first things that. Uh, drew my attention to her was she she snorts when she laughs and I, <laughs> that that's just the best thing to that's me awesome. um as for one thing that would get me to walk away if you were rude to the wait staff mm. or or rude to somebody who uh is if you have working slight a job, power over them yeah how you treat them yeah um that that's an instant like hell to the no yeah me um too. i I used to work in restaurants. I used to work in hospitality for a very long time, and I've got no end of respect for the people who do that day in and day out, yeah. just because of the shit they have to endure. So, um, yeah, that's me. Uh, who is next? I guess that would have been yeah, that's me. You. I was gonna say rude to the wait staff for my negative thing, but I'll come up with something different. Um, I want someone who's curious. Mm -hmm. Right. You can go ahead and have your morals, and you can see the world through your own lens. And I, I'm interested to know what that is, but be flexible with your opinions and your ideas, and always want to learn. Mm -hmm. The moment that you say, nope, I figured out life and this is how it is, I am disinterested. You are a closed-minded person. Yeah. So um, we should always be struggling to get the next level of understanding. I agree. Yeah. And so even even if you've got your life figured out and you're stable and solid, one of you should always be wanting to know more. There's so much information out there that our lives, we as human beings will never understand all of it. Yeah. So keep pushing. Right. So that's one. And I, I think the deal breaker is um, if they don't have a sense of humor. Yeah. I met I've, I've met like three people that are like this where I tell a joke or I make some sort of sarcastic off the cuff remark and they take me literally <laughs> and they do not understand. There's no way. I'm like, that was a joke. They say, I understand. <laughs> Fuck off. I can't handle that. That is nutty. No. I, I get it if you are so socially awkward, you don't understand, or you've got some sort of, you know, if you're autistic, right? Like, autistic people have trouble with a lot of the subtleties. I'm fine with that. I'm talking about just the overly literal, zero imagination. If I'm like, oh, well, maybe we should all stop being bitches about it. Uh, I, I'm not a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Check. I'm out. <laughs> Fuck. God damn. Yeah. <laughs> I do not need to date an android again. <laughs> Again. Anyways, Terry, what do you got? Um, I like to find out what people's values are, and I and I find that it's never what you ask them. You ask like, "Hey, Dan, what's your values?" You might say like, "God, uh, you know, like loyalty, integrity, and teamwork, and all yeah. that sort of stuff." And it's none of those things. And it, well, <laughs> for Dan, it is those things. I guess why they came up. But for me, it's fine. I'll weave into the conversation uh, what they spend their time doing. Yeah, I'll find out whether mental space is. What do they talk about? And, uh, and I'll find out what they spend their money on. And um, these things will show you what people's values... Where your wallet is, where, they, is where your heart is. Right, and they will show you what their values really are. But if, I, I enjoy the puzzle a bit. And it's not necessarily I'm doing it to judge them. It's just so you know where to go going mm -hmm. forward. You know, if it, you know, if you're asking what people spend their money on, it's a lot of superficial type of like material things or whatever and it's not necessarily on uh on learning something or they might say next year i'm going to go and get my degree in this that's great that's good value education is a good value to you you know mm -hmm. um so i like the the puzzle of finding out what people spend their what their what their values are and get them go away yeah the route to the to the to the weight stuff is always a big one for me i always look out for that but i think get up and walk away not necessarily leave immediately but decide that that's not a person i want a relationship with is if those values don't line up with what mine are and I know there's yeah, gray areas and, and, and things like that. But if but if I'm focused on where I'm going to be 10 years from now and adjusting career goals and trying to achieve this goal and, and, and whatever it is that, that I'm focused on, if they're just like, 
oh my god, you got the iPhone 10, the iPhone 12 is coming out in September, get a grip. I'm like, me and you are not aligned on what we think is important in this world. <laughs> and so, what's the point in starting, right? Yeah. You know? Um, and I think lots of times people can just be lost in that type of stuff. Like, because I think we live in that world where everybody's so conscious what everybody we're thinks about We're a very consumerist them. culture, yeah. Right, and I don't always think it's everybody's fault. I think it's, we're just conditioned for that. But for me, I look to see if our values are aligned. And if they're not, there's no point for me. Okay, hold on. Just before we launch into the episode then, do you take experience over material wealth then? Experience or intelligence or what? what's the thing that you're looking for? For... Like what they're spending their money on. If they're like, oh, I go traveling. Like if they're, they're building an experience. If they're going to school, they're building, right. you know, a, an experience. Whereas if they're if they're buying the next I th- iPhone, then... I think I just look that the, the reason whatever it is, is their own. It's, it's true to them, whatever it is. I'm increasing my education because of this. I want this experience because of this. Not just I'm doing this because everybody else is doing it right now. Yeah. You know? And it's like, and I noticed, I work in the fitness industry. I notice the trends all the time. I noticed when all of a sudden the neon New Balance shoes all went to, all girls had to have black Nikes or white Converse Chuck shoes in the bodybuilding industry. Like I see that. And that's just a very stupid example. I just thought at the top of my head. And so if I ask somebody something, why are you doing it? If the answer is just because everybody is then that doesn't work for me. That doesn't work for me. So if my core value then is cocaine, right? <laughs> because I love it, and that's what I spend all of my money on, doesn't matter who else is doing it. You're on board with me? <laughs> that's a good job. Well, you're the person that told me to always get to the root of the issue. Of there me. we go. Yeah. So I'd be like, why is cocaine so important to you? I don't <laughs> like feeling my teeth. <laughs> there you go. That's the baby powder. That's the teething powder, which is in it. <laughs> Don't snort baby powder. That will not go well for you. (laughs) Welcome to It's a Mimic with your DMs, Adam, Dan, and Terry. Welcome to another episode of the It's a Mimic podcast, the roundtable Dungeons and Dragons discussion where you never know what you're going to get. I'm Dan, and with me are Terry and Adam. Hello. Hi. I thought we stopped doing that, that pause. Oh, I, everybody does it differently. The, yeah. The, yep, sure. You never know what you're going to get. All right, yeah, let's go. Well, uh, Silver Dragons is our topic of discussion today. I don't get it. No one gets it because we haven't introduced it yet. And today we're talking about Silver Dragons. There it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got to follow the script, everybody. Got to follow the script. Anyway, so... My core value, Terry. <laughs> so, um, I'm, I'm super jazzed for this episode. Uh, Shocker. Silver Dragons are by far my favorite type of dragon. Um... Chromatic and metallic combined. I, I they are my favorite type of dragon. And uh, read the first sentence, and you can pretty much tell why. Well, I, we're gonna play the just like Dan game, where every time that Dan says something about a silver dragon, I'm going to say just like Dan, and we're gonna keep a tally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, silver dragons are. Uh, we're gonna break down their personality, their layers, their. Uh, their personality quirks, uh, their regional effects, and then we will break down their mechanics, um, starting, of course, with a wormling and working our way up to ancient. Um, but first off, personality quirks. Uh, silver dragons are the friendliest. Just like Dan. And most social? No. No, <laughs> no. Of the metallic dragons. Um, they uh, cheerfully assist good creatures in need. Just like Dan. <laughs> Uh, this is going to get old fast. Uh, yeah. Well, let's make it a drinking game. You'll be dead <laughs> in an hour. <laughs> um, their faces are um, noble, uh, have a noble cast to them with uh, their silvery scaled beards and their high brows with not a lot up top, but they do have that one ridge that goes down the back. Just like Dan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, they are tall, elegant. They start off with blue-gray highlights when they are wormlings that eventually, as they age, um, become more silvered and even their... Just like Dan. Just like Dan. And even their eyes turn into a pupilless orb of mercury when they get older. Hmm. Hopefully not just like Dan. Um, They are paragons of virtue. Just like Dan. That believe living a moral life includes doing good deeds and ensuring that one's actions... Cause no undeserved harm to another. Just like Dan. <laughs> oh, God. If I hope I never meet a silver dragon. You are like, sitting, you're sitting next to one. one. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> if there's the, out there in the world, they could be like, hey, you have a very rare opportunity to meet an actual silver dragon. I'd be like, describe it to me in two minutes. And I'd be like, I'm out. I'm good. 
Why? They are the nicest, friendliest, most cooperative, helpful. I was just saying to Adam before we started the episode, I don't like those people that judge you based on what they think you should be doing. And I feel like this is exactly what this person would do. I disagree. This this dragon, um, we'll we'll get to why later. Because they won't go out and like judge an evil deed. They won't chase out an evil deed to fix. If it so happens upon them or those who it loves, um, which is pretty much everybody. Just uh, like Dan. It will then act. But it, it's not going to judge you harshly like a gold dragon. No, but even if it happens in front of them, it's not up to them to decide what I get to do and don't do. I mean, it's a, it, they're, they're mortal paragons of good. Still, so though, they've kind of got a better view of still what's though, good. I'm like, oh, I'm Just sorry. like Dan thinks he is. I thought this was Canada. <laughs> is, it, is what I'm doing illegal? Then fuck off. <laughs> It's Canada, not Cantada. Exactly. <laughs> Fuck off. Exactly. Both of you. Exactly. Anyways. <laughs> so, no uh, as too. I said, they don't take it upon themselves to uh, root out evil um, as the bronze or gold dragons do, but will um, gladly oppose creatures who commit evil and harm the innocent. I like the word gladly there. It's like they Just gle- like Dan. They smugly. gleefully. I heard smugly. I think you're projecting just a little bit. Okay. That's because <laughs> he is the paragon of... This is Slytherin over here. Yeah. He's getting judged because Black Dragon is meeting Silver Dragon. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's true. Um, so they are also the friend of the small races. Just like Dan. <laughs> Jones! And his midget fetish. Um, <laughs> sorry. Little people fetish. <laughs> I had I had to be politically correct. Yeah, this fair. This fair. Um, silver dragons in, are well, one of the only that. dragons that actually enjoy the company of other silver dragons. Just like them. Um, however, outside of just silver dragons, they tend not to get along with the other dragons. Just like them and Terry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> are you a black dragon? Then fuck off. <laughs> and as such, prefer to spend uh, more time in their humanoid form to spend time with the humanoid races they're fascinated by the sentient humanoid races um more so by humans than the longer lived uh races like elves and dwarves mm. um they Any like longer lived longer lived 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 whatever <laughs> should have heard his argument over tortoise and tortoise an hour ago <laughs> what the fuck is a tortoise <laughs> That's, yeah, yeah dude it's tortoise <laughs> not, sure. n- not in britain <laughs> <laughs> britain <laughs> Um, the Unanid Kingdom. <laughs> Just eat your nachos and fuck off. <laughs> Paper bag. Um, dragon, uh, silver dragons will uh, often adopt a benign. Uh, humanoid persona just to interact with those around them just like them namely a wise old sage or a young wanderer uh just to help out where they can in the human world it's smug i don't like it it reminds me of jonah hill and they're is it, helpful the they're not smug they're <laughs> helpful the like we're too nice and i don't believe it like i don't i don't believe him all right. Well, and um, you're Danny McBride in This Is the End. So yeah, let's, that's right. I am Danny yeah. McBride in This Is the End. And you're Channing, uh, Channing Tatum? Hey, it's uh, Channing Tatum. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so uh, the one downside is silver dragons tend to build attachments with uh, specific humanoids. Just like Dan. Um, but will often uh, go and do their own thing for a while. Just like Often Dan. forgetting to contact those and come back. Oh, just like motherfucking Dan. <laughs> just and, goes off the grid for a while. Yeah, and will often come back forgetting how long uh, has passed between the last time and seeing that their old friends are either dead or are crippled with old age. So they will befriend their entire family line. <sighs> <laughs> I love, I love how both of you hate these guys so much. Uh, no, I just hate you right now. <laughs> just mad at you right now. Um, they have a respect for humanity where they befriend humanoids of all races. Uh, but like I said, humans and their drive and zest for life are the big drives for a silver dragon to get involved. Um, and in terms of hoarding, uh, silver dragon will mostly want to hoard tokens of history. Um, specifically the history of humans and the sh- shorter-lived races. What do you hoard? 
Dice, but besides that, dice, yeah. uh, miniatures, books, scraps of wood on the side of your house. In a way, of of miniatures house. is kind of like a silver dragon because they will befriend, like they're fascinated by by, by the these smaller races. creatures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, yeah, okay, yeah. I, I actually don't really have much of like I, I've got my Warhammer models as well that are a bit of a collection, but no. When you think compared I don't to collect. a regular person, Dan, you collect a lot of stuff. Do I? Yeah, you ain't got nothing Remember on the me. Majority but... of the no, I got is... nothing on the. What kind of dragon is Adam? No, but the majority the green? of green isn't in like the collectible <laughs> fandoms and nerd games and stuff like that, right? So compared to normal people, not to say you're not normal, compared to the regular folk, you collect a lot of stuff. We have well established on this podcast. I'm not normal, Terry. I take no offense. What is normal that... these days? Anyway, yeah, you're not wrong. You ever been on the internet? Jeez. Uh, actually, no. I do have a coin collection. That is a thing I do possess. Oh, there you go. Jesus, just it's, like just like that. Literally a dragon. Yeah. So so. uh they will often hoard coins and uh, mementos from previous uh, civilizations that may even be completely ancient and extinct, um, as well as uh, will find these ancient ruins in these high up places that were uh, built by human hands to make their layers. And with that, we'll move on to their layer. Specifically, a silver dragon's layer is often a... Uh, old ruin keeped on a stormy mountaintop, or Just a like Dan. or a uh, old wizard's tower that they can make their own. Um, this is where they will stretch their wings, but they want to be close to a civilization in some way, shape, or form, so that they could go down and mingle with the human folk. Dan, this is literally where you live. You live on. I live on a live mountain. High on a mountain. Yeah, close to the town below, yeah. where you can go mingle with the small folk. <laughs> So as their layer actions, uh, at the initiative counts of 20, the uh, dr- layer can either, or sorry, the dragon can either create a fog as if it has cast the fog cloud Just spell. like Dan. God. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, and also, I, I, I really love this one. A blistering cold wind blows through the uh, layer near the dragon. Every single creature within 120 feet makes a con, a con save or take cold damage. Gases and vapors are dispersed by the wind, and unprotected flames are extinguished. Um, protected flames, such as lanterns, have a 50% chance of becoming extinguished. Hmm. So, that's pretty cool. In terms of regional effects, um, once per day, the dragon can alter its uh, l- the weather in a six-mile radius around its lair, regardless of its whether or not it's indoors or outdoors. Um, within one mile, the wind buoys any non-evil uh, creature... Uh, due to no act of the dragons or its allies, and what that means is, if you fall within one mile of dragons' uh, uh, lair, you take no falling damage and descend at sixty feet per round. Because the air around the dragon's lair just keeps you up just enough so you don't take falling damage. Ten foot, ten ten feet a second. Sixty. No, sixty feet around. You fall sixty feet around, but take no falling damage. Yeah, so ten feet a second. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's- yeah, that's all right. Yeah, a full second to drop from the average ceiling to floor. That's that's okay. Yeah, you're not gonna hurt. With this it. also sure. makes sense considering they live on the top of mountaintops and um, just like them and control weather. You haven't learned that ability yet, but no, the weather I'm is trying. changeable. Up here. I am trying. I am trying. Um, anyways, uh, the other thing it will do is given days or rather uh, or longer to do the work. It could take the fog that it generates and build things with it. Just like Dan. Yeah. Often making the fog as strong as stone, forming structures and other objects as it deems. So. That's cool. I would like to see more of that shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, for sure. That's a really cool thing that, that uh, this dragon only in all of D&D can do, weirdly. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why do we not have elementals and genies that can do that shit? Speaking of elementals, by the way. It is weird to me that this is the first dragon that I can recall that doesn't have random elemental spawning within its uh, regional effect. Oh, no. There's a bunch. There's a bunch? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's only a handful that do. But um, so that's it for the regional effects and the personality. Let's go over the um, base mechanics of a silver dragon, starting with the wormling. So uh, the silver dragon wormling at a CR2 um is about what you'd expect it's got its flying speed right off the bat with uh 60 foot fly speed it's got pretty dang good ac and a pile of hit points just for, like Dan. for a uh, for such a low cr 
Um, it gets its cold breath right off the bat, as well as its paralyzing breath, which will... Just like Dan. Which Fuck. will slowly get more and more potent as it gets older. Just like Dan. Thank you. Um, so, first thing, it has a 15-foot cone cold breath that does... Uh, Dan, Dan's is hot air. It's not cold breath. 48 cold damage on a failed save. Um, and of course, because it's constitution, screw you rogues, you will take half as well. Um, if it wants to, though, it will hit you with a paralyzing breath, which is again a 15 foot cone, which will paralyze you for a minute if you fail the constitution save. A creature can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turn, ending the effect on a success. That's standard. That's standard, standard dragon breath stuff. Yeah. Um, mix this with a simple bite attack. No claws yet. Um, there you have your silver dragon wormling. Um, as it gets older, it also gets bigger. A young silver dragon is a large-sized lawful good creature with another pile of hit points, but relatively like low Dan. AC for its challenge rating. Um, it's got a faster fly speed, faster movement speed. Um, its biggest stats, uh, like the wormling, are going to be its strength and its con and its charisma. No. Oh. No. <laughs> Damn, I tried. Um, it's finally got multi-attack here with its three attacks, which is a bite and two claws. Um, and then it has its breath attacks, which uh, increase the DC, the damage, and also the range, being 30-foot cones. Moving on to the adult silver dragons. These are challenge rating 16, which is quite a jump. Um, again, fairly small armor class for the CR, but a mountain of hit points. These things are um, durable as all hell. Uh, they get their blind sight 60 feet by this point, dark vision 120, their passive perception is 21, so you're not hiding. And they are now legendary creatures with their legendary actions. Um, a adult silver dragon will be able to use its frightful presence ability, which is new at this uh, Just like Dan. at this level, as well as uh, bite and two claw attacks, which, by the way, are the bites doing 2d10 and the claws are doing 2d6. It also could do a tail attack at this level, which is the first time it could do that, which is another 2d8. And its breath weapons, of course, get bigger at 60 foot cones with higher DCs and more damage. This is also where they get their layers and the regional effects at about this point as well. Exactly. Um, for legendary <laughs> actions, the adult silver dragon is able to uh, detect which lets it make a perception check. Um, it could do a tail attack, um, which uh, is a normal one of its actions, or it could do a wing attack, which is fairly standard for dragons Yep. at this level. This is all normal. All normal. And finally, the Ancient Silver Dragon is a challenge rating 23. Um, its armor class is still low for this, uh, for this challenge rating, but it can get upwards of 750 hit points. Um, which is rare to get that high up um, with its 25 D20 plus 225 hit points. Yeah, you'll never get that high unless you're mechanically fucking with that as a DM anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. And honestly, are you really fighting silver dragons? Or are you allying with them as a general rule? Or are they allying with you? Well, well, sure. Yeah. You you go to them, right? They don't yeah, come to you. Exactly. So, yeah. so you're allying with them, I'd say. Um, so at this level, um, again, everything just gets a little bit mechanically boosted. Their uh, bite attacks are now D10s. Their claw attacks, D6s. Their tails are still D8s. Their frightful presence gets harder to uh, um, avoid. And their breath attacks are now 90-foot cones, dealing a massive amount of uh, damage or... Still paralyzing you for a minute, but at a DC 24 constitution save. Um, of course, adults and ancient dragons alike can also change shape, which the silver dragon, I feel, will use more than any of the other metallic dragons that get this stock. Uh, it depends. Wasn't it the bronze that like to be the generals of armies? They're going to be walking around battlefields. Yeah, but this is the guy who will just, for the hell of it, shape change into a um farm hand just to see how farming works just like dan however 
Copper Dragons will do it just to fuck with you. And that is what they do. So I would say Copper Dragons probably do it most. Co- right. Copper Dragons will, sh- will show up to be the farmhand and then shape change into someone else and say, I also want to be a farmhand. And then you'll end up thinking that you have six farmhands that you've hired, but it's just one guy over and over again. And he's going for a nap. <laughs> Accomplishing nothing. Um, just like Dan. Aww. <laughs> So, uh, the legendary actions for an ancient dragon, again, is the detect, the tail attack, and the wing attack. Which just get mechanically boosted up. So, real quick way to break down the silver dragon there, guys. Um, I want to grab the dice. Uh, Let's talk about how we feel about them on a mechanical point of view. And uh, let's talk a little bit of some unorthodox combat usages. Okay, so let's grab the dice. And go for it. I got a four. I got a six. I got a six, six. as well. Let's roll off, Derry. That's the third time tonight. I know. Eleven. I got something else. Seven. Seven. Okay. Terry? What's the question? Uh, another Any d- of unorthodox usages for them and uh, what you think of a um, silver dragon. What do I... I think I... More can... so than you've already established okay. that you just hate them. Look, I... T- and do I hate them? Yes. <laughs> I think really it's just that I would just get bored of them. And I don't like the idea. I just imagine them kind of lording over you. If that Just they, like them. Like I am. I have never I done am any right of that. and you are wrong. And my child, I will teach you. And I'm just like, well, you fuck off. This is a conscious choice of the way I'm being. And I see an unorthodox usage of them is to be like the magistrate. Of the town, because you have to go to them, right? But I kind of see it as you would bring whatever court or criminals or whatever to them, and they would judge them what needs to happen, or you would go to them without them and present the evidence or whatever, and they would decide what needs to be done. But I, I feel like then what happens when you as the party or other NPCs or whatever go out to deliver that justice, and it will inevitably become skewed in some way. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure Just the like dragon them. knows this, but it's that ignorance of I'm a lawful good silver dragon I told them what I want them to do I can't help it if my people choose to do something else I feel like that's how they will have power that is just like Dan when talking about his kids I told them to sit down and be quiet but I cannot control what they're doing yeah (laughs) just like Dan yeah yeah Yeah. just like Dan yeah yeah Yeah. Adam so I guess we'll do well uh, well, what about an unorthodox usage yeah that is an unorthodox usage yeah no I guess we're doing role playing first okay yeah we'll do role playing first um yeah honestly these guys I I feel like they're going to try to be mediators more than anything else right Henry Kissinger is a silver dragon who's Henry Kissinger really really I don't know (sighs) shit okay so he is the one that that is he's essentially ambassador for the world. I like we uh, he's um he's Austrian, I believe, but he's an ambassador for America when it comes to overseas stuff. Or he was in the nineties, and okay, uh, and uh, and he was so um, integral in in keeping the peace between warring countries mm. and ending strife. Especially right. on behalf of the UN and America and whatnot. Right, right. That, that's what I feel a silver dragon is going to be. If, if you walk into a kingdom or there are peace accords and there's one guy in the middle going, all right, everybody wait, though. I understand what you're saying and I understand what you over here you're saying. Just like Dan. Just like Dan. <laughs> Dan wants to be Switzerland, right? <laughs> and that's what a silver dragon is. Hey, Switzerland, you just didn't help. That's all you didn't do. <laughs> so, So I feel like... Like having them be the um, the mediator is very very on the nose. So my unorthodox usage is to have them sit back and say, "We're going to let this play out because everybody deserves to have their own agency." Right, right. And then I will sit there and I will help the underdog pick up the pieces after they've lost. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Right. And so I I feel like. Um, if they want to come to me, I'm not going to go in there and solve this problem for them. I know they're warring. If they want to come to me, that's fine. Or I will go down into the war-torn country and make it a better place because everybody deserves to live. But I'm not getting involved in your political shit. Right. Just like Dan. Shows up for... <laughs> this 
Silver Dra- your version of the Silver Dragon shows up for relief effort after yeah. they've ignored the war. Yeah, yeah. Right. Rob Stark falls in love with a Silver Dragon. Hmm. That looks like that. Hmm. <laughs> well, you said I am shipping a new <laughs> a, a new new couple on the internet, Dan. Rob Stark and you. I'm oh, not. I'm okay with that. Adam before said that I was Rob Stark. Yes, I did. This problem isn't. It's it? kind of awkward. It's awkward. Uh, just a little. Uh, no bullshit. I said you were Jamie Lannister. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no. You did say he was Rob Stark. Uh, I just edited the episode. Did you? Yeah, okay. you said he was he was Rob Stark. Well, I can't get that image out of my head. So please move on. Yeah. <laughs> well, so uh, so for me, um, I've said I love them. I I do not recant of that at all. I I fucking love silver dragons. Um, I like using them as uh, heads of households. Um, Just like Dan? Or uh, like patrons in a, in a way as well. Like they're the ones who are going to um, make, like fund your adventuring party to do good if they see that you're doing good. And of course they have a list of things that you have to abide by uh, or, or, or gain their ire. But they're going to be incredibly forgiving with that as well. Like, yeah, okay, I understand why you had to, you know, burn down that orphanage, but can you not next time? See, I feel like that's more understandable than the other creatures out there that have the solid rules. The devils that are like, hey, we're following contracts here. The hags and the fae with their own weird ways of doing shit. Yeah. Genies have their own fucking strange rules about shit. Silver dragons are the ones that are going to be like, all right, so we're going to do this and this and this and this order. And the party fucks up and they go, ah, oh, goddamn. All right, round two. We're going to do this and this and this in yeah, this yeah. order, right? And so they the, are going to be the more forgiving of them. Yeah, the Silver Dragon is going to give you a lot of rope, right? And and I, I really, really, really like them for that because... Just like Dan who yeah. pushes rope. I can't... <laughs> Yeah, I kind of see the most <laughs> ladies. You going to the to the Silver Dragon. That's <laughs> what so be proud of, Dan. You going to the Silver Dragon and saying, hey, okay, t- today's the day we're going to go and kill the big blue. So it was. And they're the person, they're the creature that goes, okay, everybody, let's talk rules of engagement. Let's oh, no, I don't. Of I, war. And I'm like, ugh, I, fuck. I, I don't agree with you. And I, I also would like to say I'm, I don't fully agree with the, the, with the they won't come to you. If I was to have a dragon, a silver dragon in a campaign, you have met the silver dragon before you meet the silver dragon, mm. if you understand me. Yeah, yeah, They're yeah. going to be the character that, like, they run a tavern just to get the stories, just to hear. Maybe, the, not, or, maybe or, they clean the dishes in the tavern. Or they clean the dishes in the tavern because no one else is going to do it. And why not be helpful? Why yeah. not help out with this? I got the time. I got the effort. I know how to do it. Right. But they're not. I don't think. I they, power I, the icebox. I don't think they meddle. Right, they're not meddling in other people's affairs. Uh, I think they will meddle if they feel like they need to. I knew it. I knew there was just no. like Dan. Um, but I my my unorthodox usage is I would use a silver dragon. They're not the smartest of dragons, but they just like Dan. But yes. they <laughs> are uh, more than capable enough to be the administrator of a library of some sort that collects ancient texts. I'm going to slow turn to Dan's shelf of D&D books yeah. and say, <clears throat> what just about, like oh, Dan. Perfect. What about my four boxes behind me of a bunch of AD&D stuff and Dragon Magazines? All perfectly cataloged. It's, it's, it's your ADD stuff, Dan. <laughs> You're not wrong. So, um, for an unorthodox usage of them, using them as a library... Uh, um, or a source of information for a the museum party. curator, a museum curator, like, yeah, um, who could pop the wings and help if he really needs to. But let's be completely honest, you guys are more than capable. If I give you this one item and you promise to return it, then we can, um, definitely move forward. But I mean, if it breaks, it breaks, that's okay, I guess. Oh, but man. you know, just try to return it as best you can. I'd sell them stolen artifacts. They would know it was stolen. How? Because they're silver fucking dragons. No, but you can't, you said that before. How do they know it's stolen? Well, because the, stats in be, this lore. Because well, they remember when it was a living organ, uh, living culture, they, and there? they know where that book has no, been. They, I don't like it when people say because they're a dragon. So which mechanical stat means that they automatically know if something's stolen? Well, it, the one that says they're ageless and remember everything. It should because that means I can't win the game now. 
Well, no, it just means don't try to sell them a stolen artifact without any But now you're telling me I can't try and sell a dragon a stolen artifact. You no. could sell a dragon a stolen artifact, just not a silver no, dragon. No, 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 you're wrong. Because if this is an artifact that belonged to someone else and the party comes upon it, then he, he very much would want to collect this artifact. Yes. Especially if it's from a dead uh, civilization, right? Or yeah. society. So he very much would have the Ark of the Covenant and shit just because... Well, we can't trust anyone it's else to have table. it, and and <laughs> and this has got to be my responsibility to take care of it. Thank you for bringing it to me. It's no longer relevant in this, and, so, and like, and he would take it. He would know what it's from inherently because all he does is research and know and yeah. and figure the shit out. So, uh, like, he knows because it's in his nature to look that shit up. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. I this is why I don't think I'm going to like this dragon because the people my party would know that I'm trying. That's hard to explain. I am trying to get this dragon to rub me the wrong way. Yeah. And, it's, and, and I think we do this in life without realizing something I'm con a little bit more conscious of one of those things after COVID. Because me and my BDSM furniture have no idea what you're talking no, about. No, but I mean like... Just like that. I would say... Like what Adam just used the example of this. Say, okay, well obviously I need to keep this because somebody needs to look after it. And yeah. I would be the guy that goes, why can't I be trusted to have it, dragon? Because I want them in a way to go because... I'm obviously the one needs to be trusted. You, so you, I can you, have that argument with them of fuck you. Why are you all it, it, Except this is, will also be the dragon that's like, no, no, you, you got a good point. No, yes, you can be okay, trusted. All right, you. Okay, I'll two, take it. Two things. First of all, can we just say how awesome their bitch of mohawks are? Yeah, right? Okay. Yeah, cool. I do like their mohawks. I'll give them that. All right. But second of all, Terry is telling the truth. Dan is conditionally lying because he likes silver dragons because they're genuinely good and helpful and are better than everyone else at everything. And I'm describing the NPC Irvindale that you both fucking hated. Yeah. And Terry still hates that that kind of like I'm just slightly better than you, but I want everything to be all right. And I'm going to help you, out, but really, really do it the right way. And Dan is like, no, no, no. Conditionally, when he's not that handsome, I I like him as a dragon. Yeah, but I do, well. I see what you're saying, but I don't like it when people... He defended you. You don't need to defend yourself further. He was on your no, no, side. No, no, no. I'm just... <laughs> point, I, I don't like it when people assume... I don't know how to put it. Like, he's like, I'm lawful good, so obviously I should take care of it. Fuck you. I'm a wizard. My intelligence is 20. Yours is 18. So I should take it. Like, don't assume that you're... Yes, but you're a wizard. This, your constitution's 10. Mine's 23. But, <laughs> I should hold on to it because I'll think, probably live longer. People <laughs> like silver dragons hide behind it. It's virtue signaling. That's what it is. Fuck this guy. That's what it is. He's not virtue signaling. I am good. Obviously, I am the nicest. I am the greatest person. But he's not sitting there like proclaiming his goodness from the mountaintops. No, but it's... He's changing into like assumed. the least person. No, but it's assumed. You're the one projecting that onto him. I would look for it. I would look for, and I would question. Is this what it's like when I argue with other people yes. and one of you guys has to sit back and watch? Yes. Maybe. I'm Maybe. fucking I enjoying I'm this. just this kind of dick. I look for people assuming these virtues so I can go, why? Why should you be the person? Because obviously I'm the lawful good one. But, but, okay, so the dragon's going to want to collect that towards his hoard. And, and here's the thing. If, if you come to him with a stolen item and say... He wants to take the item. He will reimburse you as well. He's not just going to let you walk away empty-handed. You brought him a gift. This guy is the friendliest and nicest of dragons. If you have if you have just a problem like with him, he will sit there and be like, "Okay, no, we clearly have an issue. Yeah. Let's work this out." Sure. Just like how that. how can we be on the same page? You can bribe I, me. I bribe didn't. Me. Yeah. Okay. Fine. I've got all these old coins. Yeah. Bribe me. But no, what, I've got new he, coins too. He's, he's lawful good. Would he bribe? Uh, bribe. Yes. <laughs> See? <laughs> well, the thing is, sorry. Reward, yes. Bribe, no. Oh, okay. I wonder if politicians have ever tried the, that turn of phrase. That 100%. <laughs> they I will reward you for doing this. <laughs> but, like, I, I, my problem with characters like Irvindale, who is just, like, good at everything mm -hmm. and is... Um, he just had a plus one to all stats and I rolled really well. Well, no, he also had an advantage on all rolls. On, that was on, the on all skill checks. On all skill checks. He was annoying because he was <laughs> trying. I love there's a huge pause. He was, like, <laughs> he was annoying. Just like Dan. He was annoying because he was 
so good natured, but was also. I don't believe he was. I don't believe he was either. I didn't like there he was, was, there was. I didn't believe him. There was a sinister aspect to that. <laughs> no, I don't think. Jeffing. I don't think it's that now. I don't think Jeff. there is a silver dragon that would have that. I because when. Okay, here's the with Irvindale's a great example. When smugness gets involved, you stop being lawful good. Because now it's now it's um now selfishness. It's, it's vanity, it's selfishness, it's ego, it's arrogance. I don't believe those are traits of a lawful good character. For Bottom line is But I I I, 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 I don't necessarily think silver dragons are vain. Nowhere in here has it said that they're vain. They have a noble cast to them, but they it doesn't say they're vain. Hmm. It depends how they put it across. Right? I like them. Uh, standing tall and and uh, having this noble these noble features, that is just that is just its way to strike like some sort of importance or whatnot to it. But I I I don't think it will lord that over anybody. Maybe. I I I think if if the rogue comes in or the barbarian comes in and is overly intimidated and he doesn't want to intimidate, he's like one second and he will change into a. Like bland human, mm. just be like, let's just have a conversation this way. Is this better for you? Can we call, call, talk this way? If it's better for you, we're golden, mm. right? Um, so I, the, I, the problem is, I'm going to try and make problems with this dragon. I know it, that's a flaw in on Terry's character sheet, <laughs> yeah. Is I'm just gonna, and know what, this guy is going to guy. be out of his way nice, and like, you're you'll c try to come up with a problem, and he will just sit there and be like, no, I get that, yeah. you got a point. You got a point. You're you're pretty smart. You know that. Mm. Like, and he will compliment, and he will. Um, Don't believe him. But he will be as sincere as sincere as he could possibly possibly be. Just like Dan. I'm gonna ask if I can sit in his throne while we talk. Yeah, I'm it's just a chair. Has one. It's just well, it's I collected it from an ancient civilization. <laughs> it's just a chair, though. So go ahead. Okay, we're gonna have to move on, otherwise I'm gonna be problematic. <laughs> for all Adam, what, what are you looking up there? I was trying to find if it said anything one way or the other in the general rules about dragons at the beginning of the dragon chapter in the monster manual or uh, uh, about it being selfish or or self-centered or egotistical or smug or any of that. Failing that, I looked into chromatic and also metallic. And while there is stuff in the chromatic about it, it's obviously lacking mm. from the metallic. So I'm going to have to side with Dan on this one. Rules as written... They're not inherently smug creatures. Mm -hmm. However, I challenge you to find me an elf that hasn't lived for 500 years and is just good at everything and sees the long game and, and knows better than a human who isn't a little smug. Yeah, yeah. And even though they're traditionally good creatures, I feel like a dragon with... And by the time you hit ancient dragon, I feel like there's at least some, well, I'll do it myself. Right, you, if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself, and I feel like that's true of every ancient dragon. Yeah. yeah okay. Right. So I think that that you're arguing silver dragons in general, and Terry's arguing uh, like the elder dragons that are just like better at shit than you. Mm. Right. I think it's just a way people put it across, and I know we're talking silver dragons in general. I know I just, and it's a character flaw of mine. I would just try and be a dick to this dragon. I'd be like, if he's like, we're going to go and do the right thing. I'd be like, why do you want to do the right thing? And I'll try and get to the fact that it's a selfish reason why he's doing it. Well, everything's a selfish reason if you go deep enough. Exactly. Which means it's not real. On, I mean, it's, it's, it is a silver dragon, so you're right. It's not real. Right, exactly. But just like Dan. <laughs> exactly. Oh, okay, we're going to do a commercial. <laughs> Hello, everybody. You guys know me as Coffee Bitch Dave. You've heard me on quite a few episodes at this point, as well as the Call of Cthulhu miniseries. Uh, I'm hijacking this commercial spot right now just to let you guys know a little bit about the campaign builder. Adam and Dan are super into this, and they've done a really good job at not just helping you with the three pillars of, of D&D, but almost that fourth unknown one, and that's the transition between them. It really helps you learn a little bit more and keep your players engaged, which is one thing that I've found can be kind of hard. It's that downtime between exploration, role-playing, and combat, and they do a great job. Anyways, guys, check it out. You guys will like it. Go do it now. I mean, maybe not right now because you're listening to another episode, but like when you're done, go to that now. Do it. Do it. Do it. And now back to the episode.
Welcome back. Uh, now we're going to talk about uh, combat with a silver dragon. Um, if they are eventually pulled to um, deal with a threat physically, um, a silver dragon has a lot of weapons in its arsenal. Um, so guys, let's let's grab our dice. Let's roll. Um, I want to know about a interesting combat encounter and uh, a interesting use for the combat side of these things. So I, I rolled a 18. Uh, Adam's got a 17. And nope. Adam's nope. got a 5. Terry's got a 17. Oh, did I? Yep. Oh, okay. So um, We both banged off of your rock there, Terry. So. <laughs> uh, my favorite aspect of the Silver Dragon... I mean, when it comes to the combat thing, they're fairly bland. Um, they they're just another fucking dragon. They're just another dragon. And, like, I can, I can land on the paralyzing breath that they'll drop that out and then wade into battle. Um, but a, a silver dragon is going to uh, fly in and try to take as much of the hits as possible so that um, your party as allies will... Uh, be able to survive whatever encounter this is longer. Um, they are quick and hardy, so I will use that to their advantage. They may have a lower AC, but uh, that just means the bad guys will want to keep trying to hit them in my mind. So a silver dragon is fighting toe to toe with um, your allies and is often trying its best to encourage and set up the combat in such a way that your party comes off as the bigger heroes. Um, that's the way I view the Silver Dragon. It's it's going to try to complement your actions as much as possible. Um, and Which compliment? Like, hey, you're doing a good job. Both. Uh, both, Ugh. hey, you're doing a good job. But Just like Dan. But also will try to position the combat in such a way because he's a big fuck off silver gleaming dragon. Um, that your wizard will have better line of sight with spells, or your monk might be able to get in with that flurry of blows safer. Stuff like that. So that that is what my silver dragon will do in combat. Um, if my party is fighting against a silver dragon, I see him paralyzing and leaving because he doesn't want to kill. Um, I don't think he's going to be the one that, unless it's an evil group, um, which has been a caveat with all of these metallic dragons. If they're evil, then, I mean, then they're just a normal big, bad, good guy. Or big, good, evil guy. Nope. Not big, good, evil guy, Dan. Big, good, good guy. There you go. Yeah. God damn it. <laughs> so, uh, he will work this uh, ability to coalesce uh, fog into stone. Use this ability f to create fog in and of itself. Um, to fly away from the party and create some distance and maybe get, leave a little thing to cause the party to think about their actions and try to become better people through them. Just like Dan. <laughs> does that frustrate the shit out of you, Terry? I just... That sounds, dude, this, that sounds obnoxious. This dragon does not get to decide what is good and what I should be. No, but it, it doesn't. But it does get to... Uh, I don't know. It's got the it's got the long sight of the dragon's long life. It is lawful good. It's super powerful. It has seen things come and go. I think that if there's anything that does get to decide, it's going to be Solar Angels and this guy. Yeah. Mm. Like a silver dragon is and a flump. Oh, I love flumps too. Fuck you, Dan. <laughs> what about you, Terry? Using these guys in combat, fighting these guys in combat. Yeah, I'd use them to put the party into a difficult position with things like Paralyzing Breath, where I would give you an enemy that over the course of the campaign has done awful, devastating, un unthinkable things to you and tortured you in ways that you can't imagine. And then I would have this silver dragon paralyze them and their lieutenants and their captains and whoever would be around them and tell them that we're going to take them prisoner and they're going to face judgment as they should and give you that awful um you know decision of what do you do with your paralyzed enemy which is in front of you that the silver dragon has told you you cannot kill because we are better than that i like it i really do okay. like that. i'd love to do that to you dan okay yeah sure better than that i would like adam to do that to you because he would do it better than me so. <laughs> let me take my pants off <laughs> uh 
<laughs> what what about if they're on your side? Are you are you? No, the, the silver dragon is on my side. Sure, Adam, what you got? <laughs> I can tell you a story. I, I we're we're running through this relatively quickly in this episode. So yeah, I got time for a quick story. Um, let's talk about morality for a second because I'm I'm going to tell you a story about the time that I worked in a haunted house. Right. There are rules to working in a haunted uh, to entering a haunted house. Don't touch the actors. Don't touch the props. Don't run, don't push, don't shove. Essentially, don't be a dick. Keep mm. keep light to yourself. Try not to swear. It's a family environment. If the occasional, ah, oh, fuck, slips out and that's okay. But you know what I mean? Don't sit there and start screaming profanity at, at monsters. The actors that are in the house and the people running the shit in the background are just people doing a day job yeah. and so on and so forth. Okay, so I worked in a haunted house for a number of years. One of the things that I remembered was on a particularly slow day. This doesn't. This is not going to paint me in a good picture um, at all, but I'm going to go in this direction anyway. We had um, we had a room which we called the dark room, and the dark room was utterly huge, and uh, it was, as you can imagine, dark. Whereas everything else that you would run into at this point was a darkish room with a spotlight on one creepy thing right. here or dim light with like. Uh, spider web looking stuff that you're pushing your way through and wanted this one was pitch black and the really crazy thing about it was the room had five sides all of the sides were slightly rounded so that it felt like they were straight but they weren't and there was a door in the middle of one of the walls across the way from you but there was a uh, air horn and a light in one of the corners which would re-blind you and disorient you so you would get lost in this big room and go trying to feel your way around and the room just feels huge and it feels like there's a strange number of sides you should have found a door by now right and walking straight through and trying to keep a straight line with your hand on the wall will not lead you to the door immediately so you can imagine this disoriented people it was a lot of fun but a lot of people get scared because they're just suddenly consistently like jumping and 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 freaking out we would put an actor in the room wearing entirely black, including a hood and gloves and everything else. You would get really, really good at knowing where the people in the room are and closing your eyes. And if you were wearing the hood, the the air horn would not deafen you. If you could close your eyes at the right time as they would trigger the motion sensor, then you're not going to be blinded. So you your eyes have adjusted and you can see in this room and they can't. So you just keep walking up to them going, no, over here. Right, and it would it would scare people oh, all the God. time. So this was a fantastic room, and it was one of many rooms in this house. I loved it quite a bit. But the way in and the way out each had uh, an access panel, where the doors would swing open to allow actors in and out. Right, without you didn't want to be in there with seven people. You're yeah. going to get touched, and they're going to be flailing, and so you could bail out and then open up little windows and call at them, and they would see a red light over here. They would head in that direction, you run over to another window and open up and no, I'm over here. Right? And that would mess with people too. Yeah. But these doors opened and they opened in such a way that they blocked the entrance and the exit if you opened it up. So if someone was walking around by the exit, you could open the access panel and it would feel like the wall was solid and there was not a door there. And so you could get stuck in this room and go around three oh or four times. God. We had one goddamn kid. Here's where the story is. Now you've got the premise. We had one goddamn kid that came through and he was 14 and super mouthy. Mm -hmm. And he sat there and was ripping on, uh, uh, like trying to rip things off the walls and screaming and using a lighter to see his way through things. And, and of course, you can see all the, the access panels that are in the dark and whatnot. Well, we managed to get in there and get the lighter from him at one point because, you know, it's a fire hazard. At which point he starts screaming F-bombs and, and racial slurs at us. Wow. And so he's just this terrible human being. And and we had one person pop up in a big devil mask and say, we're going to teach you a lesson. And we kept him in an infinite cycle inside this dark room for about uh, 20 minutes. That's a long time. That though. is a long time. And there it was a particularly dead day and there was nobody else going through. And as we sat there... Um, on the outskirts, we were yelling, you know, every kind of crazy monster was we could think of. We were yelling how to be a good person. And we could hear them banging on the walls. And every once in a while, you would know that the light it triggers. You can hear the air horn. go, Bang! And then he screams. And everyone on the outside was being very lawful. Yeah, yeah. And very good. And tormenting the shit out of this kid for 20 minutes. So you have frightful presence. 
and you have that fog, the fog cloud turns into solid walls right. and shit. Now you have the Paragon Good, I will teach you a lesson, Dragon, that is a pain in the ass and is terrifying and is going to fuck with people. That is how you get a lawful good creature to be super freaking mean and still stand by their virtues. I'm teaching you a lesson, whether you like it or not. I think this is why, if you were to use that scenario, this is why or how a silver dragon would make a big bad out of me. Because they would do that type of thing. <laughs> Knowing the characters that I play, like if I imagine Solomon, that would happen to Solomon. Yeah. But Yeah, you, you stick to your guns with your characters. But my your... argument would be, or Solomon's argument would be, it's not up to you to decide what the lesson is and who gets to teach it. And I would be the kid that would go off and ultimately become the big bad that comes back later to try and get that dragon. Yeah, I, I, I could see that being a very interesting little plot hook of uh, this dragon overstepped its bounds this one time. And your character, although you may be good, you want to go and teach that dragon the same lesson. Well, oh, I well he paralyzed you, you and he took your agency by taking all of your weapons yeah. and armor and everything else while you were paralyzed. Yeah. And they left you in a fog cloud until you were starving and begging. And now you understand true humility. And you can learn a valuable lesson. And he just took it too far. Yeah. yeah. And to, to, to the point that humiliated. Yeah. Right? And that's... Yeah. yeah. There's there's a fine line between humility and humiliation. Yeah. Right? And so put that on a bumper sticker. <laughs> so um, one of them turns carry on. Um, and it's not humility. So <laughs> obviously. <laughs> but, but no, the, the idea of teaching someone a lesson... By taking away their agency between the fog cloud and the paralysis and the lawful good, that really feels like this is a, a silver dragon method for the greater good. And so that's how I would turn this into a, this is my unorthodox usage yeah. to, to make this an, a pain in the ass for players. It's, I think I'm making it more difficult than it needs to be, but for I see this as a difficult dragon. I do see this as a difficult topic because it's, most people will agree, oh, well, the dragon should have done that. That's correct. But I will view it as that is not correct. It is not up to you to do that. I, to I, I think of the movie The World's End, yeah. uh, Simon Pegg and Nick yeah. Frost, you know what I'm talking about, where they've got this, this hive mind of aliens that has come in and be like, join our collective. We will take away your free will, but you will be happy. There will be no more war. Right, right. There will be no more issues. All, and, and the big point was was they say, no, fuck you, we're humans and we'll do it our way. We're messy and we're gross and we're dirty and we fuck it up and it's our right to fuck it up. And then the world ends. Spoiler alert. <laughs> and, and at the end of it's the, a ten-year-old movie. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and at the end of the movie, they're running around dealing with the uh, post-apocalyptic world. And the aliens or the robots, whatever, could have saved them and they said no. That's Terry. Yeah. Right? No, let me... Use my agency to do it my way, even if I fail. I, th I think that's it. Even if it's there saying, you know, it's it's even further than that. It's me saying you don't get to decide what is correct. Just because you say it's correct does not mean it is correct. Whereas I think Dan sees it as lawful good. Is it a, It is a paragon of good. Dan believes in absolute good and absolute evil mm -hmm. inherently in and of himself. So it's easier for him to ally himself with paragons of good whereas terry believes in the gray area and says uh, right but what's a catch yeah not you can't be completely good yeah. whereas i i view the silver dragon as yes completely good but i right. but it is that adam but i'm saying good to who because you're telling me this is good but i don't agree with you so who is right i i i think that would be a really interesting uh encounter to have because I would view the Silver Dragon as probably trying to see your... Um, he, he'd be tempted to make it a like psychological evaluation, almost. Mm. Right? He'd be, he'd be like, no, no, but it, it is good. It's objective good. That's the problem. And, and, and it's I, 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 I understand that you believe that this might be subjective, but let's... let's Let's hammer down why you think this is subjective you see, and right, try right, to work it out. But the damn thing is, he's going to paralyze you. He's going to take away your spell components and your weapons so you can't fight. So you've re he's removed your agency and he's going to trap you in a fog prison. He's going to say, now let's talk this shit out. I, I, I think if... if 
if, he would not start it that way. No, but he was he's if, completely willing to go there. But I, I can I can go there as well in the sense that as soon as he paralyzed me, let's just pretend we're in Canada. Like as soon as he paralyzed me, I'd say this is Canada. This is a free country. I have the right to free will. You have paralyzed me. You are unlawful. I would say it that fast. Um, I mean, you wouldn't. You'd be paralyzed. But exactly. Uh, but that's the point right there. But. Uh, it would be if if you drew weapons against him. Him paralyzing you is an act of self defense. No, it isn't. Look how many hit points he has. It, it's an act of calm down and listen. No, I would say it's an act of self defense for him. He doesn't want it's this like de escalation. I guess right? right. Like he 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 would only use it as a de escalating measure. Um, and yeah, he's got a mountain of hit points and could stand and fight, but. He knows his level of power, and he doesn't want to... Um, He's never doing lethal damage. Yeah, right? Yeah. Like, he doesn't want to lose control and accidentally harm you irreparably. Right? I mean, a Silver Dragon might end up having a couple clerics on retainer. Just, like, a couple guys he could call, and then he'll pay for the resurrection. It'll be fine. <laughs> right? Like, don't I don't have to worry about anything. The, I've known this cleric for a couple centuries. He's good. He's, he's he's an elf. He'll be able to help out, and he'll do it gladly. Yeah, and I know we have to move on, so I won't go on about this forever. I think I know, but I also know we my, don't. We're actually going pretty quick. We oh, can yeah? continue on this. Well, I yeah. know. I know my my flaw is that I will try and trip this dragon up. Yeah, I, and I, I think that 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 brings that brings a that, certain level of drama to the silver dragon. That's most that's most players though. Yeah, we live in a world of murder hobos and and minstrels, fucking bards, <laughs> right? Like the murder hobos and minstrels is a better name for this game. <laughs> <laughs> but but there is a certain amount of of my agency matters more than your storyline. Every player thinks that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And so the moment that you're dealing with and it does. Oh, yes. From a game design standpoint. From a game design standpoint, it it does. It absolutely does. So when you make a silver dragon who is designed to take away agency, your players will become indignant pricks. Just like Terry. (laughs) 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 But that's what I I recognize that as a flaw of my own. And that's why I said right from the start, I was like, I am not going to like these dragons because we will rub each other the wrong way. Just like Terry. Yeah. (laughs) So we will, because I, I, yeah. But but that's that's the thing about them is them passing judgment, yeah. Right by imposing their morality, that is passing judgment on a scenario of not a person, right. And but I think that Dan's right; they are forgiving. They will also say, okay, just do do better next time, right. The, Even that bothers me because that's if fuck you. It's not up to you to decide how well I did. <laughs> they, they, yeah, but if they if they gave you the quest and you come back. With a failed quest. No, that's right. That, no, and they go, the okay, you know what? Yeah, just do better next time. Like, if you're talking about them stepping into your life and being like, hey, you know, I've been watching for a while. And yeah. you, you burn down that orphanage. Can and you not like, masturbate? Could you not furiously <laughs> masturbate over the smoldering wreckage? <laughs> like, <laughs> I, th- I think that... The missile, it's it's deep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I think the silver dragon... Has the right to say that, but you as a character also have the right to tell him to shove off, to go fuck himself and walk away. And the silver dragon be like, we'll talk later. <laughs> yeah, but but the thing is, he won't fuck off and go away. He's just going to walk away and become the next NPC and follow you around. Right? And that's, I think, the thing that's going to piss off Terry. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, no, no, no. It, it'll be, we'll talk later. He flies around you, goes to the town you're in the direction of, changes himself into a different NPC that just so happens to be in the tavern. And you guys walk by him and he calls you over and gives you another quest as the Silver Dragon again to try to help guide you in the direction of good. I, I also feel like... Again, though, I feel like he's forgiving, right? Whereas if you fail a quest for a green dragon, you guys get handcuffed into working for a green dragon yeah, for a level yeah, or two, that's right. and you come back with a failure, he's going to say, that's fine. Choose one of you to die. <laughs> and then you will do better. Whereas a silver dragon will say, ah, okay, look, here's 100 gold. Go out and buy a new sword because we're going to do better next time, <laughs> exactly. right? So you have a benevolent benefactor right yeah. so um i i think that that this is very much how you want to play your dragons yeah and it is so uniquely different i honestly think that all of the the chromatic dragons are close enough in personality 
that have all got severe ego problems and they want to watch people burn, right? They want to watch you twist and scream mm-hmm. and um, maybe not the white dragon so much. He wants to feel you crunch between They just argue over who's better at it, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, and, but the, the metallic dragons are so unique as far as personality goes and the ability to shape change opens it right up. Yeah. Two, meddling. And that's what I think the plot hook is because mechanically these guys are boring AF. You're not wrong. They're all exactly the fucking same. Give or take a breath weapon. So... Or a burrow speed. Right? Like there's yeah. there's not a whole lot here. Also, the I'm really interested by this this fog as well. That's a really cool mechanic. Why do elementals not get this shit? Yeah. Why do wizards towers not have this inside? And right, like, regional effects. Yeah. 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 So I, I want to see I want to see a, a beholder mage, a beholder with spellcasting abilities, do this in their lair, right? And their lair is just a great big open cavern, and they twist it and shape it as they need, right? You can very much see people doing this. I think that if you live in the Underdark, remember there's that radiation fog that li- that is down there? Yep. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. Um, but you would think that that matron mothers of the drow would be able to warp that shit. And the lithids would be able to, to yeah. move it and whatnot. And make it solid sometimes. Maybe an elder brain would have the... Like, whatever it is, I want to see this shit more often. Yeah, and like condense it to a liquid and put it on your uh, arrows to shoot. And that's part of the drow poison. Yeah, uh, look, you are you should be able to do this with water as well inside lakes. If you're in an underwater campaign or you go beneath the wave for whatever reason. Oozes should be able to just turn slime solid. Right, like we don't have any of this mechanic anywhere else, and I like it. It's really cool. Yeah, I think we can think outside the box with it. Um, and maybe the dragon's lair starts off. Uh, you know, it's mountaintops, right? But yeah, but you you walk in the bottom. The mountain is hollow for hundreds and hundreds of feet in diameter, and the next doorway is way up there, and you can only get up there when he makes the ramp out of the fog. Mm-hmm. Right, like there's some really cool things that you can you can do with this. Um, also, splitting the party, yes, in a big way. Yeah, and and uh, we will get to campaign usages in a moment. But for a specific encounter, having a ever changing labyrinth that your players have to get through in order to get to the end, which will end in the interaction with the silver dragon, I think is a great way to use these guys in an encounter level. Um, it's going to be complicated to plan as a DM, but it's going to pay off. Yeah, yeah, no. and and you just like plunking down little pieces of cardboard, saying, "Nope, that's a wall now, and that's a wall now, and that's yeah. a wall now." Brings back that old style of uh, um, exploration that I feel is a little lacking in D anD D five e and in recent editions of D anD D, where you, as a player, are writing the map as you go along and like mapping and cartographing as you're going. So. Yeah, you're making that shit up as, as you go as a DM. You're just like, and now a wall here. I want this to last four more rounds, so a wall here and here as well. Mm-hmm. Right? And you're making, again, just like Dan. Right? <laughs> making it up as you go. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, we're going to hit a shout out, and then we're going to come back and talk to campaign usage. Hey guys, Megan here, wanting to kind of shout out myself. Uh, During the time of COVID-19 pandemic, instead of finding a new hobby, I actually decided to resurrect an old one and start drawing again just for fun. Uh, I started my own new art insta that you are more than welcome to follow. You'll find character art, just general doodles, and attempts to use new supplies and materials that I've never used before, so it's quite interesting. Uh, Feel free to give me a follow at Omega Art, so that's zero M-E-G-G-A-R-T. Should you already follow me at Omega, you can find the link within my bio. And thanks, Advance, for any support, uh, follows, and likes in the future. And uh, enjoy the show. All right, guys. So uh, as we wrap up this episode, we've gone um, we've gone at length about whether or not their morality plays in. But when it comes down to a full-on campaign, um, let's answer a couple questions here. Uh when do you use a silver dragon as a big bad evil guy in your campaign? Um, what is a set piece encounter? And I want to know um, more specifically a single creative idea to use this dragon as an NPC. Because I think we can all agree this guy's mostly going to be social. 
not so much combat mm. related. So let's grab the dice and roll. Nice. I got an eight. I got a one. So Terry, when yes. do you use this guy as a big bad evil guy? And uh, do you use him as an NPC? And what's one creative NPC usage for this? Yeah. Uh, big bad evil guy, I think you, you there's an opportunity here to play on how they are nurtured from when they're young. Okay. To twist them, to make them question what they believe is correct. This is actually one thing I, I you're causing me to uh, yeah. remember. I failed to mention silver dragons will uh, live long lives in their human form, but will leave to go and mate and raise children. Right. They uh, got a fuck pad back in the mountains. Well, they have lifelong mates and they raise their children together. Just like damn. <laughs> And then when when the children are old enough to take care of themselves, they will go back. And this is often like a period of 50, 60 years. So they'll go back to their buddies who they used to play cards with. Just like but now have. they're old men. And now some of them might have died. So they're like, all right, well, I'm going to invest into your children because your dad was fucking awesome. Yeah. Right? And and it's like the the uncle that – the rich uncle that you have – but don't really know about that suddenly you are inheriting mm -hmm. a lot of money from, right? It's it's going to be that kind of situation with them. So anyways, yeah, dragons, silver dragons, mate for life and rear their own uh, children together. So rear. rear their own children together. So continue. I'm sorry for interrupting. That's okay. That has absolutely nothing to do with what I was talking about. But <laughs> good to know. Okay. Is... Um, is, is uh, to twist it the way that they're nurtured, right? I think that naturally they're going to be inclined to follow their lawful good kind of roots. I think it's just that's why they're kind of all like that, right? Is they're just it's a behavior in them that they're it's almost instinctual. But I think if you can get hold of one of them when they're young, you can instead of trying to twist it um, to make them question what they think is right, is to full just eye robot it, just exaggerate the hell out of it. To twist them to the point where they go, you are right. I have to remove their ability for them to hurt each other. And so, Oof. if you, you've got a load of dragons now taking off arms, taking off legs, taking off... Every time you go over there, you hurt these people. I will <laughs> stop you from moving. But don't worry. I will stop you from hurting each other. So, so you go full on Terminator, shoot them in the kneecaps. Socially paralyzing them. Uh, social distance them stop them from getting close to each other because when they get close to each other they hurt each other and now you're all lawful abiding good citizens you have a group of silver dragons move in because they they raise their young you get enough of them suddenly there's seven or eight um, adult silver dragons that move in and they just they just fill the valley with this fog that is just a solid wall you can stay within do not enter the fog. Yeah. And would that be like a... Years, it's been would, 11 years since we had a single crime. Would that be like a quiet mountain or a uh, silent hill of some kind? I would think you would give it a real positive name. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I caught it now. <laughs> Took you a second. But but I know. I think you could. You could you could lean on those types of names. Like Sleepy yeah. Hollow. Yeah. Right? Those the village. Yeah. Yeah. It, right, it sounds... and, and they sit there and they say, "Do not go into the fog. There are monsters in the fog, and they're people. They're the elders that have been here since the beginning of of the village. Don't go into the fog." And when someone says, "You know what? I'm going to go in," and they find a way in there, well, we'll have to remove their hands. This will be a warning to everyone else. Yeah, and it's going to keep everyone outside the valley safe. And he's not dead. Yeah. So there we go. Yeah, but I, I like that. I just really, really exaggerated. Go full eye roll up. No, that that that's really cool because like the best intentions, but now it's a straight up horror campaign. Mm -hmm. I, I I like it. But Terry. nobody's hurt each other. No, we, no. Well, I mean, if you I, cut I, off I, your I hands, hands free for ten thousand nine hundred and sixty one exactly. days, <laughs> broke, broke a single law for eleven years. Um, for me, Adam, you actually kind of hit the nail on the head. Uh, with your idea Just of a like whole that. family of uh, silver dragons moving in, I've actually played uh, in. Uh, previous edition I played a silver uh, dragon disciple um, who was basically a monk sorcerer character who, who was raised up in this family that uh, the silver dragon family was named Malice um, and they uh, 
were this silver dragon family that was highly political um and the entire plot point was determining the intent the 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 intents and the motivations of this large silver full silver dragon family um that kind of rule over this entire kingdom they they are long lived they are um unchallenged because there's about 10 of them and uh my entire character arc was i was the one character was like no the the humans should probably live on their own that like we should let them rule themselves and we should go and watch from afar we don't need to be um telling them how to live their lives we but we should help them be successful in their lives make their lives easier but not by ruling over them and and that was my entire character arc with this guy so as for a um full campaign arc doing um maybe removing the maliciousness of 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 terry's idea there uh and and making it so they're good leaders but because of their long view the short-lived humans have issues with it it's like we can't just wait 120 years for change we need the change now yeah and here this little half dragon or half elf that eventually uh starts showing some dragon sorcerer uh traits or whatever it is um gets to speak to the family as a member of the family as a descendant of the family to convince them to leave and this is this this would be a work with a character who wants to play like a dragon blooded sorcerer to say hey what about this kind of story idea especially if they want to go silver dragon um when to use them as a big bad evil guy i i find it very hard with all the other selections of uh dragons we have I don't see Silver Dragons being the big bad evil guy. And I find it very hard to fit that in my frame of mind. Um, mostly because they're forgiving. They are um, the, interested the, the in The forgiving humanity. is a thing that you have, have put on that. Well, they, they go out of their way to help humanity. Right? Which to me, with them being f the friendly ones, with them being the ones that are investing the most... In humanity, of all the other dragons, they're the ones investing the most. I see them trying to see the best in people. You don't think that that they can be swayed given enough time? You can say the same for for Solar Angels. And we very easily turn them into tyrannical leaders that say, law above all else, come hell or high water. For the good of the community, law, and if you break it, death. And you don't think that a Silver Dragon could be that? For the, for the good of humanity, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. I would say that, uh, yes, I would say that it is different for a solar angel because of their extra planar aspect. Because they are not from this realm at all. Whereas a dragon has grown up and lived and breathed in this realm. But amongst the evil. All of the time that has tempted and and pushed at them and what other other uh, other races other uh, um, good intentioned monsters going up to this point, uh, I would agree with you. I don't see that in a silver dragon. I see them being paragons of good. I find it very hard to parse them being the evil. That is you projecting your own shit just as much as Terry saying mm. they're smug assholes as him projecting his own shit. That's true. That, that, that's not for written, my part. No. Yeah. yeah, that that's not written anywhere. Like, uh, yes, they're all about humanity and they want to help people. They're not. It doesn't say anything about being the patron that will always do the right thing no matter what, right? It, it, there's nothing in there that says these are the above uh, above everything else, the be all and end all good creature. You are projecting that. So I, I Dan, I respect your opinion on that yeah. one. You run your silver dragons way that you want to, but that's that's not hard and fast rules as written how silver dragons no, are. No, I mean I, I, I would I would claim that it is within the subtext of, of their description as you as you read it that that you could get to that conclusion. Um uh, I will admit that yeah, I probably run them a little bit more paragony than I should. But um when you have so many 
other kinds of monsters to deal with, especially if you just stick within the metallic dragons themselves. Having a deeply, uh, sorry, having a deep characterization in a silver dragon, I, and like having him have um, this this like tyrannical view, unless he is a central figure to the campaign, I don't see a point. Right, him being a benefactor, sure. Him being the guy who inevitably play makes the sacrifice play for your party, yes, I see him doing that. Right, um, that's just the way I run them. So, like, I could see a a silver dragon have a silver dragon having worshippers and having people that come to it to pay homage, but I see him taking all of that and redirecting it into good. Right. He is investing like, uh, in in the like lower uh, income families. He's 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 th this this all uh, looks back at your days as of three point five when alignment fucking mattered. No, and and you're right, but I don't play. I don't even necessarily play a silver dragon lawful good. I play them more neutral, right? I play them neutral good because I want them to be paragons of good. Not necessarily lawful paragons of good, which is why they are going to hold a certain amount of um, forgiveness to them when I play them. You just made me realize something here and my, how my approach is different to yours. I am the Lex Luthor in this, of this, where I am saying it is not, when you're talking about how they're all for humanity, yeah. I'm saying it is not up to the Silver Dragon to dictate how we run humanity yeah. and to be the judge in the jury Listen, and all that. Listen, alien, get the fuck off my planet. That that's kind of how I'm viewing it. Like it's it's um, it's which is not ironic up to them to decide. because Lex Luthor is bald, just like Dan. <laughs> but what I do rude. like about your <laughs> just rude. <laughs> what I do like about your vision, Dan, is you you're using the silver dragon as the the extreme point on the good scale yes. you know all the monsters all fall in somewhere and for me it seems that the silver dragon is is the 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 goodest of the good over here yeah. and that's kind of and then we judge everything else based off of that point of how far back it goes well and 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 right. that that goes to my reliance on the alignment chart as a dungeon master to determine the actions of my monsters right, right? um them being lawful good um, is just because lawful good is for is seen as the best good, but I think neutral good is no, the best good. Yeah, neutral good is the best good. Lawful right? good is following the rules. Just like lawful neutral is the best lawful, and chaotic neutral is the best chaotic, and neutral evil is the evilest. Yeah. Right? Like I I love having the 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 silver dragon be that paragon and then be able to like sit on a council of metallic dragons and say, hey, that's not the best action. That is not that is not the action that is um, the least selfish for us so to do. So, for the moral compass, silver points north. Yes. Okay. It's interesting that he's not the most powerful then. Because for the moral compass, the red dragon points the furthest south. Yeah. Um, you can make an argument for black, but I think the red dragon. I agree. Um, so, and he is most powerful, and he wields it. Whereas the silver dragon is is more good. Fuck, I hate the better. There we go. Better on the good alignment scale than um, than the gold dragon. Yes, and therefore has to negotiate. Yes. Okay. All right. That is an unorthodox use of a silver dragon. <laughs> what about you, Adam? We, that was a lot of talk God. between me and Terry. It, no, it was good. I, I, I liked it. Okay, all right. So, like, um, this is a pretty deep conversation I didn't about. I think it like, was going to get this deep on silver dragons. <laughs> Honestly, we're so far into the dragons at this point that I make wanking motions every time I drive up to your house to do a dragon episode. Because you like them so much. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, honestly. Um, I'm really uh, aligning with Terry on this about um, being too good. I want to le lean into the too lawful, right? But where um, you're doing the too good, they want they can't hurt each other. Mm. No, no, no. I'm going to play these guys lawful, stupid, right? Straight up, where this is for the greater good. You need to to stop. I'm going to remove you from a group. I'm going to say that that I don't want you um, to influence people anymore. I think these guys have massive dungeons where they're just. I'm not going to kill you because murder is evil, 
And I did not get elected to be a judge. So, into the labyrinth with you. Live out the rest of your days. I'll be tossing food down on Thursdays. Oh, God. And he and he just has hundreds of people down there. And when one of them is on their deathbed from old age, because he uses his, his fog to keep them all separate, he goes down, he pulls them up, he lays them down in a comfortable bed and says, what did we learn about our life? And he lets everybody else hear it. But that is fucking hor- horrifying. Yeah. Right? Because he's not the executioner, but he's still the executioner. Yeah. Right? And so that's my big bad evil guy. As far as an NPC goes, have you guys heard of Paradise? Mm-hmm. Paradise. If you climb the tallest mountain and you have a good enough uh, entry fee, a sacrifice of a, an item. We're not talking goats or people or anything. You, you need to bring... An item that is worthwhile to the realm, you can enter paradise. And once you go up, you can live there forever. And paradise is a monastery or a temple or a small commune. It's a civilization at the top of the mountain where everyone is happy all of the time. They are social. They are talking. And they're not mind controlled. They're all just together. But there's a long winding path with many trials to get up to it. And paradise is literally just the name of this area where the silver dragon lives with his family and there are a handful of people with silver hair and silver eyes that look like humans that walk around and interact with everybody and you can purchase the good life you can retire your character by bringing a good enough item up but you will never go back down I don't I, I love your idea but it, you that, know, it sparks all the problems for me that, that you probably that, expect that um, I have a problem with that as well because it's super culty well, no, but it, it requires payment. Well, you are now being accepted to paradise because you have paid the price that not everybody can afford. That, it, and I don't like that. If you have the true heart of a warrior and you are truly out there to do the best for the region and you want to live a good life, all you have to do is follow these three steps. Go get a, a, a significant item. And it doesn't have to be a golden throne. It's just a significant item. A copy of the Constitution. Right. Right. You have to make your way up the mountainside to prove that you are hardy and worthwhile. We're not here to take care of the infirm. And uh, you have to agree that once you enter, you never leave. And that's it. And you will join us and we will be social and we will talk and it'll be great. And the silver dragons just run the area. And they even, like, they do the dishes and they cook and they, they will do the laundry because everybody else is going to be happy and they're going to talk. We're going to hear all your experiences and where did you find this thing? And what was it like in that dungeon when you went to go fight the Beholder yeah. to get the ice? And, and they can control the weather around them. So it's always a bright, sunny day. Yeah. And so yeah. they literally are lawful and good. And here it is. Okay. That's but, that's my NPC. But this, I love it. But this immediately sparks to me. Man, I'm being a bit of an a-hole today. I don't mean to be. Just to spark Just like Dan. The one of those big questions that I know everybody hears. <laughs> it's everybody a hears a lot. Okay. Am I truly lawful good if I only did good things because of the promise of paradise? Yeah, look. Okay, yeah. Okay, we are going to get in a super, no, like... No, no, no. I know. I'm deep, not, no, no, I'm existential gonna, conversation stop, stop, with stop. that. <laughs> I know. I'm, not, I'm saying we're not going to go down that route, but that's the first question that comes to my mind. It's not lawful good. No. And I know it creates a whole argument. No, 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 but they are creating law. Remember, law does not mean... Like, in Dungeons & Dragons, it does not mean following the legal rules no but it means following the 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 moral code that you have and i know that's the big question that always goes out in the world but that would be the first question i would ask the guy at the gate i'd go what like (laughs) this is bullshit yeah when when you don't have when you don't agree that there is objective morality these guys get weird Mm -hmm. right if you do believe that there is objective morality they're a lot easier to accept yeah, right. yeah, but I like the idea of them just passing the judgment. You and you can just drop off the item if you want, or you can take it back with you. You don't have to give it to us if you make it all the way up here. That's that's the key that opens the gate is you give us the item, so that we know that you are truly a good person because you've gone through trials. You want to earn this. This is not just something that you want to do on a weekend because you can't leave. Yeah, right. So you earn it and. Or maybe you can leave, but you're never allowed back in. It's a one yeah. shot only to paradise. And, and then you have those Buffy episodes where there, where she was like, "No, I was in heaven, and you assholes pulled me out." Yeah, yeah, and maybe maybe that maybe that's your plot hook is you got to go in and get the retired character or the NPC that's gone to paradise. 
Oh, that's so oh, God, awesome. That's deep. And then deal with the fact that they were in actual paradise. Yeah. And you and all oh, of the NPCs God. you brought with you and your mounts and everybody else are welcome in. But if you leave, you're going back to the war-torn kingdom that you're from where there are the Underdark and there's the uh, Outer Realms and there's uh, elementals that are, are flying around creating havoc. And there are there's slavery and evil and goblin hordes. Are you really going to get your NPCs and mounts to go back to that world? Or do you want them to live their happiest days? Oh, man. I can't play a campaign with a silver dragon. That's what I've learned. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, guys, is there any other little notes about silver dragons that we want to bring up here? <sighs> other than existential dread and trying to figure out where our morality comes from? <sighs> My morality comes from fortune cookies, Dan. I follow the yeah. latest fortune cookie that I open. I, I would play them... I wouldn't play them as... I think what this is telling me is I wouldn't play them as preachy. This is right, this is wrong. Yeah. I would I would use them, even as an NPC, to ask questions to try and guide the PCs. They ask leading questions, yeah. I'm, I'm with you. No, Dan, don't put it on what you would do. This is what <laughs> I would do. No, no, no. I no, would no. get them to question why they're doing something. To, to steer them to where they want to be. Because sometimes you can't see because of the fog, like in life and stuff like that. So I'm not going to be like, I'm not going to try and steer them over to what I want them to do. <laughs> I want them to ask themselves why they're doing what they're doing. Yeah. And if it makes them happy and if they think it's right. Not do this because I think it's right. And frankly, if I'm going to drop a Silver Dragon NPC down that may or may not help them, I would say, hey, tell me the story. And then the bard or whoever will... It's, it's a fun encounter. Everybody gets to sit back and tell the story of everything that they've done up until this point. Yeah. And I get down and he goes, was that really the best idea? Were there any other options you could do? And you can ask them and have them ask the question, are we the bad guys? Yeah. And and when, which, you know, is my fucking jam. Yeah. And so <laughs> moral ambiguity is where I live. Um, but as people, as people are sitting there re recounting all of these, these things that they've accomplished and the deeds they've done and the, intelligent goblins they have murdered on the side of a road and the silver dragon sits there and says yeah i'm not gonna bother with you guys you're beyond you're beyond <laughs> repent at this point you're just i mean you're walking around with the tiefling assassin what do i do with that right so please do as little damage as possible and uh hey light cleric come back and see me in a couple of years Everybody else. It's, it's, it's been fun. It's been great. And oh, you're going to hell. Yeah. yeah. And, and here's here's some gold, just so you don't have to murder anybody before the next town. But yikes. <laughs> oh, I like that kind of, that, kind of uh, that, uh, John Constantine type story of, you know you're going to hell once yeah. this is over, so don't die in the game. Yeah. Because you know where you're going after this. Yeah. So, uh, that's, uh, that's Tomb of Annihilation, isn't it, right? Uh, the, the idea that if you die, you're dead. Oh, yeah. So don't die. Don't take risks, mm -hmm. right? Stay yeah. alive. Yeah. And it, don't take risks. Now we're going to walk into the uncharted jungle where the uh, single bug bite could kill you. 100%. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I don't know. That That's, that's kind of my final I, I, I really like the idea of just as an encounter, uh, if, you're, if your party rolls ridiculously well on a random encounter table, just like walking through the jungle, some old guy walks up. Uh, while you guys are camped and like just sits down and wants to chat, and they're all going to be so suspicious too. I know, right? And and they just talk and and you can't lie to this guy because he just knows. Um, and yeah, his charisma is very high in this. Yeah, and and you're just you 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 go through this entire process of telling him, and he just wants to know your party's story. Like his first question is, "So what do you call yourselves?" Yeah. Right. He wants to know what your party name is. And like, like, he just wants to know all this information. And depending on how you answer his questions, depends on what kind of gift he gives you before he goes, mm. all right, changes into a silver dragon and flies away at the end of the counter. Mm. I don't even think he does that. He just walks away and then someone else, seven sessions later, says, did you guys ever run into this old guy? And I was like, yeah, well, that was fucking weird. Was, that guy's a dragon. And everyone goes, whoa. <laughs> the silver hair. Richard Gere's a dragon? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anyways, guys, that'll be it for this week's episode on Silver Dragons. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube, as well as dozens of other podcast apps. You can also find us at itsamimic.com or email us at info at itsamimic.com. Thanks for listening to the It's a Mimic podcast, and make sure to check us out next week when we're covering Theros. Just like Dan.
I don't know what that implies, but I just need to say it one more time. Yeah, fair. Drink, bitches. <laughs> don't die, please. You've reached the end of another episode of the It's a Mimic podcast. Connect with us at itsamimic.com. Don't forget to subscribe and hit those share buttons. Thanks for listening and see you next week. All right, guys, this episode we have been talking about silver dragons and uh, how the much they're the they're the friendly dragon. They're the, they're the f- dragon that loves humanity, loves the short lived smaller races the longest and especially loves their history. And it got me thinking of all of the like ancient human civilizations that we have around the world. Which one fascinates you guys the most? So grab the dice and roll. Oh. 17. 17. Man. Got to roll off. What do I get? 19. 19. 16. 14. 14. Man, some good rolls. That's some, yeah, pretty damn good rolls. Good rolls. Mesopotamia. Why? Because it is the beginning of everything. I would absolutely love to know. I would love to explore the idea of them getting agriculture down and building the first temples. Mm-hmm. and And discovering what is religion and how do you organize it. How do we write our yeah. language yeah. it is the dawn of so much that we take for granted today we talk about the industrial revolution really pushing us forward no man mesopotamia the cradle of life that area there as things were just booming and we we just we finally decided as a species to stop moving and to put down roots and to figure our shit out and the more clever you were the better off you were Right. This was not about how much riches you came from or survival of the fittest anymore. This was survival of the cleverest. And that's why I like it. Yeah. Cool. What about you, Terry? Um, I like a lot of ancient civilizations. I do, but probably no surprise to you guys. I really like the Roman um, Roman history. Yep. Um, and I think it's because of the sense of order that it brings like I come from a military background and so when it's like I like the whole idea of like the metric system and there's 10 people 100 people 1000 people I'm like that's perfect for my stupid brain to work with <laughs> I know that there's three groups of 100 um, but I like their I like their deities as well obviously there's parts of their civilization that we kind of wouldn't do these days with regards to slavery and how they treated each other uh, um, but um, they were very innovative, you know. They, mm-hmm. they, what, what they were able to create in that time is is um, amazing. It really is, and I really like their their military history. And uh, I like the again, this might shock you. I like the idea of great empires that are able to take over large parts of the globe. <laughs> Your <laughs> British is showing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the UK, we appreciate a good empire. <laughs> um, for me, I, I don't know, man. It. I'm I'm I've always been super jazzed about ancient Egyptian mm. um, history and lore and the tone of it as well. Um, I like as people who listen to the podcast know I like my horror campaign and I definitely like when weird shit from the past comes up and it's almost always got some sort of an Egyptian hieroglyphic feel yes. if I'm running that in my game. So um, it's like Egyptian but with squids and that's kind of my ideal instead of cats. Yeah. So. Um, I, I've always loved it, and I mean, to be a civilization that could accomplish what it could, when it could, um, in the pyramids and the Sphinx and all that other. Didn't stuff. Didn't you know it was ancient aliens, Dan? <laughs> Dan, do you use TikTok? No. Oh, there's a guy on TikTok that goes in deep and all like the ancient Egyptian stuff. And I mean, there's the... there's YouTube. That's that's a thing that yes, does that yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> Old man's TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to an It's a Mimic production. <laughs> 